Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you are here. I know I got a few hours to go, but let me be the first one to say Happy New Year. Um, all right, the first service, they did not want to get rid of the old year yet. It is time to move on, so Happy New Year. Oh, so much better. We invite you to stand with us as we begin our time singing together.
And Father, truly is appropriate that the fruit of our lips at the end of this year would be singing of your greatness. And as we look forward to this year to come, Father, pray that your greatness would go before us and make a way. We do pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again, and a special good morning to those that are watching online. Today is a fifth Sunday, so we have invited our children to be a part of the beginning of our service, to be a part of our worship together. And um, so we have a video that we're going to show you from our fourth and fifth grade class, kind of giving you a little bit of an idea of what they are learning, and then they're going to be reading our scripture for us. So if you have a Bible with you, or maybe one on a device, I would encourage you to go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 24, that is going to be the passage that they will be uh, saying to us because they've memorized it, but uh, we're looking forward to that. But first, we're going to get kind of a little update about what they've been learning down in their Sunday school class. Hi, church. Um, I'm here to tell you what we're learning this year down in the fourth and fifth grade Sunday school classroom. This year, we are talking about big questions like what is truth? Um, is the truth true for everyone? And this unit we're working on right now is about worldview and what does it mean to worship something? So we talk about these big questions and then we look at the scriptures um, to see what God's word says. And we've also been working on memorizing portions of scripture that relate to what we're talking about. So here's a video of our kids and what they've been learning. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine knows them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Everyone then who Mic on? Yep. Oh boy, 2023, it's almost over. How you doing on your goals and your resolutions for 2023? You got about 13 hours left. <laughs> See what you can get done. Well, most of us do not uh, complete our resolutions in any particular year. But there's a new year, and the Bible talks about God and his mercies, and that they are new every morning. Every morning, we get a new start with Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. We're going to pray, and I'm, it's, we're gonna, I'm gonna pray in kind of segments, and you'll, you'll pick it up as, as we go along. And um, uh, join, uh, let's, let's pray. Father, I, I first want to thank you. We want to first thank you for all the blessings that you have poured upon us in this past year, even in the past life. Uh, you have given us so much to enjoy, and you have given us great moments of rejoicing. And even in the tough time, Having you there has brought us joy. Father, we're going to reflect now for, for a minute, silently, and just mull over in our own hearts and minds some of the blessings that you have given to us this year.
Father, this world is a shaky place. There is so much uncertainty and distraction. But as we will sing in a few minutes, when everything around us is shaken, we've never been so glad that we have put our trust in you. You are the unshakable. We do put our faith in Jesus, but we, if we're honest, I think we have to admit we may have, uh, like Peter, maybe denied you once this year, maybe twice, maybe three times, maybe more. Father, we are not perfect and we know it. Our heart's desire is to be like Jesus, but often we fail. So we're going to take a moment now and just personally just confess our weakness and realize that you are our strength and that, yes, mercies are new every morning. And lastly, Father, I pray that in this upcoming year, you might help us to heed Paul's advice. Forget what lies behind and reach for what is ahead. Help us to have a single eye, to be people of faith, to not be double-minded, but to be stable. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is the fifth Sunday of the month, which means we have all of our children joining us for the first half of our service, which is awesome that they can sing with us and pray with us and be a part of um, our worship service together. So we're going to do something a little fun this morning, and adults, I'm going to ask you to step out of your comfort zones a little bit here. We're going to add some hand motions to a song that I'm pretty sure most of you probably know called Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. So when we get to the chorus of the song, we're going to, when it says, you came from heaven to earth, we're going to point up to heaven, like right now. There you go. Good job. Um, Except you're going to use both hands. I'm not because I'm using my microphone right now. You're going to use both hands. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross. And then you're going to put your palm out. My debt to pay. From the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You do this. There you go. You got it. All right. How, did, did a lot of you already know this already? So you, some of you are experts. Awesome. Let's do it one more time. Ready? You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my debt to pay. From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. All right. So let's have some fun with this. I'm also going to ask you to stand while we sing this and lift our voices. This is the gospel. We're singing the gospel story together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Not yet. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save. All right, this is the part. Here we go. You came from heaven to earth to show the way. From the earth to the cross, my death to pay. 
Good job. Thanks, helpers. That was awesome. Thanks for coming up. And we just heard our kids read the scripture about the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains came and the storm came and the wind blew, his house stood firm because Christ was his foundation. And that's what we're going to sing about now because the storm's going to come. Scripture says it. But when it does, are we built on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ? Because he won't fail us. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. He's never.
be seated. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jen Liebarger. I just wanted to give you guys a um, little intro here. The kids sang at the 9 o'clock service, and we can't hold them all till this service, so we have a video for you, hopefully. Um, but the kids have, this last spring, learned the Old Testament books of the Bible in order, and we put motions to them. Um, this fall, we added the New, Test um, yeah, the New Testament. So uh, we kind of put it all together into our song, and so they've learned all of the 66 books. And um, the motions that go with it are a little sneak peek of something that kind of sums up that book. So they've learned kind of a motion that um, summarizes that book of the Bible. So enjoy. Our Father, we thank you for all these young people striving to learn the outline of your word and that we pray that they would learn the details and hide it in the center of their hearts and that you would be with this next generation and help us to disciple them properly in your word, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, good to see you in the end of this year. And and before we delve into the book of Romans, I just wanted to quote a couple of verses uh, from the Old Testament regarding the specialness of the nation of Israel. Psalm 135.4 says, For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob his allotted heritage. He found him in a desert land, and in the howling waste of the wilderness, and he encircled him, and he cared for him, and kept him as the apple of his eye. In the book of Zechariah 2.8 adds, For thus said the Lord of hosts, After his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Long, long ago, God chose this little nation of Israel to be the recipients of his divine promises. 
but he did not choose her because she was extraordinarily strong or extra holy than anyone else. He chose her so that he could transform her into holiness by showing them who he is. They were promised a land, the land of Canaan, where they would become a nation called Israel, produce a kingdom so that they could birth the Messiah who would bring light to all the nations. Those are the positive promises that were given Israel, but there were some negative promises as well. Deuteronomy 28 through 30 lays them out and indicates that when they are not obedient to his word, they are going to experience chastisement and even uh, dispersion where they will not have the possession of the land, although the promises are still theirs. And we know that this has happened because wherever the Jewish people have been dispersed, they tenaciously hang on to their characteristics. When different nationalities come to America, we call them you know, Polish Americans, Italian Americans, at least for a generation. But after that, they're just normal Americans. But that's not true regarding the Jews. They are still referred to Jews no matter how many generations they've been here. And that's true in every country and nation that they go into. And so a byproduct of their being called out is that they teach the whole world the gracious patience of God. They show his glory because they show that God blesses them beyond measure when they are obedient, and he chastises them more than others when they're not. They have national promises that are recorded in the scripture, and they must come true because God's word cannot fail. We're told that heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not fail. So what is the evidence that we have that God's promises are unbreakable? That's how we ended the last time we were together in verse 6 of chapter 9. Here is a one-sentence summary of what I'm going to be saying in this paragraph, verses 6 through 13. Israel is the object of God's eternal promises, not because of their natural abilities or superior qualities, but simply because of his own choice. And so let us read a couple verses, verse 6 of chapter 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. I have to call upon you to remember the context of this section. Uh, We just got done studying Romans 8, right? And the theme of that chapter was the security of the believer. That no matter what happens in this world, you cannot lose your salvation once you have received it. Well, this truth caused the readers of this book to ask a question and say, okay, well, if that's true, if there's nothing we can do to lose our salvation, then what in the world happened to the nation of Israel? You see, God's word must have failed because they are not presently believing. Why is it that the majority of the Jews do not believe in the scripture's Messiah? And so the dissenters suggest that Israel lost her chosen status and that they were not secure and therefore we are not secure. Well, verse 6 begins to answer this question. It says, it's not as though the word of God has failed. It's not true. For the, and this is the reason, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. The text clearly states that the word of God has not failed. And this isn't the only time that the New Testament or the Old Testament declares the faithfulness of the word. One of the most famous verses of Isaiah is chapter 55, verse 11, that says, So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And I want to tell you, this verse is one of the greatest comforts to me 
when I started in ministry, I didn't have some grand strategy on how to reach the world for Christ. I didn't have a perfect plan for how the church ought to be. And although we do produce short-term goals, most of them are just to help us keep from stepping on each other. Uh, That's the basis of it. But my main goal in ministry has always been simply to teach God's word because then he will accomplish his will through his people, with or without me, because his word must be fulfilled. God never starts something that he doesn't finish. And this truth is part of the very definition of God. He cannot change. He cannot lie. And so when he promises something, it must come to pass. The fact that many individuals in Israel at that time, as well as today, have rejected Christ is not a failure. See, rather than a failure, it is really a demonstration of God's faithfulness. You see, there is a most fascinating prophecy made in Deuteronomy 28, 65, and it reads this way. And among these nations you will find no respite, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot, but the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. That was given to the nation of Israel that said, when you, if you are disobedient, I'm going to scatter you throughout the nations, and you're never going to find a place for your foot to rest. You're going to go from one place to another. We... We call it the wandering Jew. The Old Testament and general history testify to this. You see, Judah was captivated by Babylon in 586 B.C. and taken out of the land only to return 70 years later. But when she did, she was under the thumb of Gentile nations like Persia, Greece, and Rome. And although many Jews lived in Israel during the time of Christ, They were driven out of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed, and they were dispersed throughout the rest of Israel and then into uh, Western uh, Europe. In time, they fell into conflicts with the Muslims of the 8th century. They were abused during the Crusades in the first millennium, and then they were dispersed further into Western Europe. And when the Black Plague occurred in the 14th century, it was blamed on the Jews. Consequently, they fled to Russia and to Germany. And in time, Russia persecuted them. Watch Fiddler on the Roof. And then they were almost annihilated by Hitler's Germany in World War II. And the Holocaust drove the majority of Jews to the United States, and especially New York City. And for many years, there were more Jews in the United States than anywhere else in the world until just recently. Just in the past couple years, there are now more Jews in Israel than the United States. In 1948, Israel was reestablished as a nation after 2,000 years of exile, a feat that's never been achieved by any other people. And I believe, personally, what is happening is a fulfillment of the great prophecy of Ezekiel 36 and 37. The dry bones, the people have come back to the land, but the spirit is not there yet, and that's what we're waiting for. But why is there still such a rejection of Christ by the Jewish people? Well, one reason, just a glimpse, is that Reformed Judaism, which is the most liberal branch of Judaism, believes that the people of Israel themselves are the Messiah. They they believe that Their role is to bring social justice to this world because it's so lacking. And so they are on the cusp of all the social justice causes because they believe that's the Messiah. The Messiah is not a person, it is they. And some actually think the nation of Israel is the Messiah, and that's why they're persecuted so much because it does say that the Messiah will be despised and rejected, right? That's their theology. Salvation in this form of Judaism is not concerned about individual sin. It's concerned about societal sin. Don't worry about your own self, but how do you treat other people? And so social good is how they bring salvation to the world. 
in sacrificial sacrifice by good works, which is a far cry from the substitutionary atonement of Scripture. And so ancient Judaism missed the Messiah. Modern Israel misses him too. And so how can we say that God's word has not failed? It's a good question, isn't it? Well, the reason is because they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. What is Paul saying here? First of all, the word Israel refers to the physical lineage of Jacob, otherwise known as the 12 sons of Israel. But there's a second level that scripture adds here. There is a true Israelite is one who also expresses faith in the Messiah. And so this is just a continuation of the argument of Romans 2, 28 through 29, that that a true Jew is a Jew who also is a Jew inside because they've trusted Christ. There is such a thing as spiritual Israel, but the definition is a true ethical, ethic, ethnic Jew who also believes in the Messiah. Not the church, but an ethnic Jew who believes. We call him a completed Jew, Messianic Jew. And that's who the promise is given to. Not to all the other Jews who don't believe, but to the ones that really do believe. And so not everybody is dis- who's descended from Israel is a spiritual Israelite. That's the subject of the text. And if you don't want to take my word and you need some bigger scholar, well, Thomas Schreiner has said, nowhere in Romans 9 through 11 is the term Israel transferred to the church. And the issue that Paul confronts here is whether the promise made to ethnic Israel will be fulfilled. Now, since many of the readers were familiar with the Old Testament, Paul uses two scriptural illustrations here. All Jewish readers at that time knew that Abraham had another son beside Isaac. Who was that? Ishmael. He actually had many later on, too. Ishmael. And so Paul quotes Genesis 21, 12 in verse 7, and he says, Not all children of Abraham are part of the promise. And so we need to go back a little bit and think about Abraham. Abraham is the core figure in what we call the drama of redemption. He was promised that his seed, his children, would receive a a great land, produce a great nation, set up a kingdom, and produce the Messiah who would bring salvation and light to the whole world. That promise first came in Genesis chapter what? 12. That's when he was first given that prophecy. But nothing happened right away. If you read the story of Genesis, we find that 10 years went by and he still didn't have a son. And so Genesis 16 through 18 tells us a little story, an interlude that happened because of his impatience. His wife, who needs to be cut a little bit of slack here because it did not specifically say she was going to be the mother until later on. And so she convinced her husband to cohabitate with an Egyptian servant named Hagar, and he produced a son named Ishmael. And we don't have time to study the whole story, but the point is this. Ishmael was of the seed of Abraham, right? But he didn't receive the promise. Abraham wanted him to be the one, and so he pleaded with God in these chapters, and he said, please, make Ishmael the fulfillment of your promise it, you know, it's all done. You've already halfway met the promise if you just let Ishmael be the son. And God said no, because he was not his choice. And I, I could stop right here and give a direct application to us as a church and just spend the rest of the time thinking about this. But, you know, there are a lot of people, maybe even in this room, who develop an idea about what they think God ought to do for them. And so they ask him to do it. They even pray fervently. And then because they've prayed about it, they consequently think that God's got to do it. And so then they start living in a way that fulfills what they want. What is the lesson for us? That's the story of our lives, isn't it? We so often pursue 
things that originate in our own hearts, in our own flesh, instead of the more sure things that are written in God's word. And we need to make sure that we properly understand the promises in the first place because they cannot fail, but often my plans do. And so verse 8 continues, and it underscores the issue of the text. It reads, this means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. It's not the natural inheritance, but the children of the promise are the ones who are counted as his true offspring. Natural descent made Ishmael a child of Abraham, according to the flesh, but he was not a child of the promise just because of his physical descent. And so here's where the quote from Genesis 21, 12 comes in, verse nine. For this is what the promise said, God's being more specific. He said, what I said was, about this time next year, I'm gonna return and Sarah will have a son. I didn't say anything about Hagar. I said, Sarah is gonna have a son. And so God narrowed the promise to Isaac and not to every child of Abraham. You know, later on, he marries Keturah and has another 10 kids. They don't get the promise. Ishmael was not a part of it. And so the phrase about this time next year refers to the gestation period. Within a year, Isaac would be born, and the promise came before he was even conceived. And so you have to note this. The birth of the promised child, Isaac, was a miracle, just like our salvation is a miracle. It would not have happened if God did not intervene. Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90. And even though they had to cooperate, it's God that caused the miracle. And so the story of Ishmael and Isaac demonstrates, first of all, that not all children of Abraham received the promise. Got that? That's the first point. It was narrowed to Isaac. Now we can understand that because There were two different mothers, but let's get a little more scientific and look at verse 10. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might be continued, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Someone could argue, "I, I understand the Uh, Isaac over Ishmael issue, two different mothers, but Paul now calls forward another scriptural illustration that's more specific. And he quotes from Genesis 25, 23, and he gives the story of Rebecca, who's the wife of Isaac, who's part of the promise, and she's pregnant with children by one man. You know what that means? That's a technical way to describe the production of twins. It's a way to describe the children of the same mother and the same father by the same sexual act. You talk about getting specific, right? Who were these famous twins? Jacob and Esau. And prior to any consideration of their merit before they were even born and were able to do anything good or bad, God's purpose of election was to choose one above the other. And so Jacob and Esau had the same parents, and technically Esau was the oldest, right? He came out first, but the heel grabber was right behind him. Jacob came right out. And in the ancient world, and especially in Judaism, the eldest son was the primogenitor. That means they were the one who received the bulk of the father's inheritance. So you have to understand in the ancient world, agriculture was the main way of living. And if you split up your land every time you had a kid, within a generation you have no more land, right? And then everybody has to live in the city and has no joy in life whatsoever. (laughs) And so the eldest got the bulk of the land and the youngest had to shift for himself. He got a little bit of money, but he had to start a whole nother farm. Well, Now, Jacob and Esau normally probably would have shared firstborn privileges since they were twins, but God's purpose was to elect and choose the youngest over the oldest. He did what was not expected. God's call 
is specific and it refers to the covenants regarding the Messiah and the land and that did not include Esau. Esau was physically related to Isaac but he isn't part of the promise. The stress of the text is that the choice occurred before there was even any behavior. No one could say that, well, God chose Jacob because he was going to be a nicer boy. If you read the text, he wasn't any nicer. He was a conniver. It was God's call that eventually transformed him into one who would actually seek God. But that came afterwards. Jacob, as an individual, was chosen in order that God's choice might continue. It was God's choice. It was his business, not human descent. So here's the point again, and maybe you can see it on this chart. Even though God promised to bless Abraham's descendants, it was, it was just one branch of his family that was blessed. As you can see by the graphic, the promise started with Abraham, but it excluded Ishmael. It went through Isaac. It then went to Jacob and excluded Esau. And then in the time of Christ, when Paul is writing, only those who have trusted Christ as Messiah are the inheritors of this promise. Not just because you're Jewish, but because you're Jewish and you also believe in the Messiah for salvation. Do you get it? You get the connection? That's what's going on here. And so the emphasis is upon him who calls. This is why we say the word of God cannot fail. What is happening with Israel today is exactly what God said was going to happen. He never said he was going to save every single Jewish person. God's call in this instance resulted in the declaration that, that the older would serve the younger. Now it should be noted that there is no biblical evidence of Esau himself ever serving Jacob. But we do know that Esau became the father of what nation? Edom. And there is a passage in 2 Samuel 8.14 that says that he, David, that's Israel, put garrisons up in Edom and all the Edomites became David's slaves. And so that was fulfilled, literally. God's promises do not fail. And this truth leads us to the ultimate reason why his word cannot fail. It is unfailing because it's based on his choice and his choice alone and not what you do. Verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. See, there's one more quote here from the Hebrew scriptures. It's from Malachi chapter 1. Once again, nothing is mentioned in the Genesis account concerning God's hatred towards Esau himself, but later in Malachi, it is addressed towards the people that he produced, the Edomites. Both Esau and Jacob, in this point in the story, are used as representatives of two different nations. And by quoting Malachi 1, Paul raised the discussion from the level of personal election that we've been talking about to national election, and then he's going to come back to personal election at the end of the chapter. But Esau produced an idolatrous nation that was eventually judged. And so I need to handle this, this phrase, love and hate. This, has this ever bothered you that... God loves Jacob and he hates Esau. What in the world is that about? Well, the word hate is a figure of speech. It's an idiom in Hebrew that means disfavor or disregard. We often say the opposite of love is apathy, right? I'm not apathetic. I just don't care. What is going on here is much like what is found in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. There we read Jesus says this. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not what? Hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even his own life, he can't be my disciple. What's he saying? Obviously he's not saying that, he's not commanding us to hate our family in the way we understand hate. Because both the Old and the New Testament 
are filled with commands about honoring your parents and taking care of your children. So that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is on a priority list when it comes to serving God, all of these things should be like they don't even make the list. It, another section that uses the word in the same way is when Jacob was getting married and he got tricked with Leah, right? And in Genesis 29, 30, it says that he loved Rachel, but he hated Leah. It wasn't that he hated her. It was, she, she was not his choice. He chose Rachel. And so it's a, an idiom. And Alan Johnson illustrates this by a game that his children used to make him play with marbles, colored marbles. And the object was you had to collect just one color of the marbles. And at one point, the kids said to him, Daddy, you hate blue marbles and you love red marbles. And so we even use that language today. Esau is Isaac's son. He fathered the nation of Edom. And yet it was Jacob who brought the promised seed through his lineage. God's choosiness is what is important. And the choosing of Jacob's nation to produce the Messiah and the passing over of Esau's nation does not mean, listen carefully, does not mean that individual members of Esau can't get saved. That's not what it's saying. We're talking about the privilege of being the nation that brings the Messiah. Esau wasn't chosen. But Esau's descendants can accept Christ because of the promises of Jacob. You get it? We're not saying that everybody in Esau isn't saved. We're saying they just weren't the ones who brought salvation to the earth. As to the statement, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, one day Spurgeon was preaching on this and a woman came up from the congregation and he said, I can't understand why God should say that he hated Esau. And Spurgeon said, well, that's not my difficulty. My difficulty is how could he say he loved Jacob? In fact, many preachers have added to that, how can he say that he loves me? That's what you should be feeling. The story confirms that it is Israel as a people that received the promise of the Messiah and the right to be at the center of God's future. What Paul is illustrating through the nation is that God has a sovereign, elective purpose that he carries out on his terms regarding personal salvation as well. So first of all, salvation is never based on natural advantages. What you are by nature does not enter the picture as to why God redeems you or not. Underscore this, God's election is unconditional. Second, salvation is always based on a promise that God gives. And that's why we're exhorted so much in the scriptures to believe and trust the promises of God because they're, they're based on his choice, not ours. So I want to I want to close at this point because it's it's too much <laughs> to continue into the next passage. I hope you read it so that it won't be as confusing next time. And I, but I want to ask you a question as you've been listening to all this. How do you react when you hear about this love and this hatred that's unconditional? Do do you think in your mind God, this isn't fair. This isn't right. If it bothers you a little bit, then that means you're starting to understand what it's talking about. Because you see, God's ways rub against our pride. And Paul will address those reactions exactly in the next couple of paragraphs. But for now, let us please let God be God. Either he is sovereign or we are. Heaven help us if it's we. D.J. Kennedy gives an example, an illustration trying to 
to bring this difficult doctrine to bear. He says, suppose there are five people who are planning to hold up a bank and they are friends of mine and I find out about it and so I plead with them and I beg them not to do it and finally they knock me down and push me out of the way and they start out. Well, before they go, I tackle the last one and I pin him to the ground and the others go ahead without him. They rob the bank, they kill a guard, they're captured, convicted, and put in the electric chair to die. The one man who was not involved goes free. Now I ask you, he says, whose fault is it that these men died? Did I make them hold up the bank? Didn't I try to encourage them not to do it? Didn't I plead with them? Was it not their own free choice of their own sinful hearts that caused them to lust after this money? They had nobody to blame but themselves. Now, what about the other man who's walking about free? Can he say, because my heart is so good, I'm free? The only reason that he is free is because of me, because I restrained him. And so it is that those who go to hell have no one to blame but themselves. And those who go to heaven have no one to praise but Jesus Christ. That's salvation by grace from beginning to end. And what a wonderful teaching if we can learn to receive it. God has not failed just because some of Israel has failed. The true Israel, that is Jews who receive the Messiah, are still in existence. We call them the remnant, and we're going to look at that in detail. And that brings us back to Paul's concern in the first place for his fellow brethren. Remember the beginning of chapter 9? He's concerned that the Israelites, according to the flesh, who, who have all these wondrous promises that are going to be fulfilled, don't get to enjoy the promises because of their present unbelief. He's saying God indeed will have his way, but individuals may miss out on it. And the application to us is this. We learned in chapter 8 that once God chooses us, He justifies us, he calls us, and he's going to glorify us. We are secure. There is nothing in this world, neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Jesus. But what happens during this life now that we're saved is this. The Holy Spirit slowly sanctifies us. Sanctification is the process through which he makes us holy by transforming our minds, freeing our wills, and empowering them through the Holy Spirit so that we can start to obey of our own will and thus experience the joy of this life. I mean, that's what life is all about, people. That's what life is about for you. Now that you've been freed, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You can experience the joy that you're supposed to have if you learn to trust his promises rather than yourself. The amount of joy you experience is how much you trust the unbreakable promises in your daily walk. And so we need to look at Israel, in this case at least, as an example of what not to do. You want to know what it means to live in the flesh? Study Israel. They were a privileged people, but proud. They didn't trust God. They trusted their heritage and their history. Your family may be Christians, maybe generations of Christians, but that doesn't make you a Christian. I hope you know that. Special privileges that come to you by natural means are never the basis of God's redemption. And so you might be sitting here and asking, well, how do I know I'm one of the elect? Well, ask yourself, am I deeply aware of my sin? Am I truly eager to have it dealt with? If you can say yes, then that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is working on your heart. He may not have gotten through all the way yet, but your response should be to surrender and repent. You should call out to him to receive the forgiveness that was granted to you because his son was crucified upon the cross for your sins. 
And only once you do that can you really be able to start trusting his promises. You can try it on your own, but it ain't going to work. You may ask, why did God choose me in the first place? And I've searched the scriptures over, and I can only find one reason, I think, that he chose you. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Thank God you're nothing. It's your only hope. It's your only hope. Your salvation is based on God's choice, not yours. However, you can have full assurance and joy in your life if you trust his unfailing promises. And so what can we do to better trust God's promises in 2024? Well, the more familiar you are with his promises, the more confidence you're going to have in this life. This year, one of our Bible memory groups wants to challenge us to take part in what's called a sword grip. It's a program that helps you in a year's time to memorize a phrase or one verse, maybe two, out of each book of the New Testament. And those verses are based on what the theme of each of those books are. So that if you commit to this over the year, you will memorize the themes of every book of the New Testament and be able to think through the whole book. And you can do it with a group. There's music and aids to help you do it, and we're gonna be announcing how to sign up for it uh, in the next week or two. But wouldn't it be nice if we all got more familiar (laughs) with this book? Let's pray. Our Father, Lord, we pray that you will indeed impress your promises upon our hearts and we know that you cannot break them and that if we, as we know them, we can make better decisions for you in the power of your spirit. May you bring the joy of the Lord into each family here in 2024. In Christ's name, amen. As we close our time together, I invite you to stand with us as we lift up our voices. The earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do. Faithful and true, though the storms may come and the winds may.
unto him whose name is faithful and true. May all glory, majesty, power, dominion, both for now and evermore. Amen. Go in peace.